Hello, my name's Whit Waldo. Uh, before I get started, I just want to thank the Dapper Day organizers for you know putting this whole event and for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm the founder and CEO of a startup called Innovian. Uh, I architect and build custom software solutions and provide technical help to firms that need any additional perspective. Uh, my whole career has been spent in uh, the tech consulting business with the last several years really focusing on building out distributed uh, applications. I've built several solutions with Dapper that run in production today and have been developing a SaaS product that will hopefully launch this next year. I mostly work in Azure. I write .NET applications in C-sharp and F-sharp. <clears throat> and a couple of weeks ago, after spending the last year or so uh, writing several contributions for Dapper, on the documentation and SDK fronts, I was on bar, on, onboarded as the newest maintainer of dappers.net SDK. So you'll frequently find me answering questions and issues on the .NET SDK's GitHub, and then also in the Dapper Discord. <clears throat> I'm gonna start today by talking through several points of why it is that Dapper was attractive for me to develop on, I guess kind of building off that video we just saw and then take you on an architectural tour of how several of the p key parts of my own application uh, were built and run on Dapper and how Dapper has just really made this process a lot easier. So <clears throat> have you ever developed an application locally, you know, got working just right on your machine, packaged it, deployed to the cloud and found that nothing was working? Yeah, I've been there. You know, the, I feel like there are continued problems with, uh, you know, uh, the, the environment you see in development time and what you see in production. You've got, you know, authentication. You know, locally, you may be using environment variables. In the cloud, you're using managed identities. You know, you may have uh, resource availability. You know, you, if you're using various cloud services, those may be, you know, firewalled in a way that you simply can't access them locally. You're stuck using emulators or, you know, kind of lightweight clones of whatever it is that you're otherwise deploying to. You know, it, especially it's difficult to reproduce more exotic errors. You know, tracing certainly helps, uh, but, you know, there's, there's nothing like actually running it in production to see, you know, production specific problems. And I find that Dapper really helped here. You know, it's it's not an emulator. You know, assuming you've got version parity, you know, between your cloud and your local environment, uh, you know, the Dapper that you're running locally is the same one that you're running, you know, in the cloud or wherever else you're deploying to. And you know, as, as a number of people pointed out in the you know video we just saw, the abstraction is very useful. You know, you are riding against uh, abstract. Uh, concepts of these building blocks, uh, and that you know, if if you decide, hey, you know, DynamoDB is not working out for me today. I need to switch to Cosmos for whatever reason. You know, it's a matter of swap out the components, reconnect. You don't have to change your development code, and that, you know, that's really helpful. Uh, if you plug in an emulator, you know, it's it, it, again, it's, it's just a matter of swapping out the components, and you know, really. Uh, Utilizing Dapper's resiliency policies to, you know, easily, you know, it, I, I guess accommodate any of these, uh, um, you know, issues that you may experience in the cloud. You know, you uh, submit a, a, a some kind of an invocation, it fails to come back, uh, and you know, it may just be network timeout, it may be, uh, you know, something wrong with a service temporarily, um, and having Dapper essentially step in, provide an abstract layer between you and these other environments, very, very helpful. Uh, I think it helps with uh, scalability. You know, my, my startup is constantly looking to cut costs. So I'm usually relying on some kind of infrastructure monitoring. You know, we saw a presentation from Newegg earlier talking about, you know, uh, kind of sharing some insight into how it is that we should, you know, autonomously scale up and down. Uh, it's really helpful being able to deploy on Dapper in a way that I, if, if I want to, you know, I, I can deploy as many services as I want and deploy, you know, scale these up and down as I need to and simply know that I can, you know, send, you know, some requests to an application simply by knowing its app ID. 
uh, you know, it gives me a lot of freedom to scale up and down and not have to worry about where exactly is my service, you know, on, on what machine is it running. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's really helpful. If it can go wrong, I find that it often will. You know, I spoke a little bit about the resiliency policies earlier. Um, you know, there's there's uh, some some errors you just can't reproduce. You know, the, the network request gets interrupted, services are temporarily unavailable. Uh, you know, maybe that external service is just timed out. You know, it's just not responding for whatever reason. It's not necessarily your fault. Uh, there may be some kind of a, a scaling problem. You know. Uh, uh, activity bursts or you know causing your service to you know simply not get routed to the right place. So it's it's really helpful to have these policies in place that lets you uh, potentially time out your your operations, do some kind of a retry and back off uh, operation, um, and you know this is helpful being able to scale the you know scope these to s specific sets of app IDs. So it's not necessarily across your entire solution. Um, but can really just say, hey, you know, this this cluster of apps over here, you know, I, I need to, to apply these policies, but maybe some slightly different one over here. Uh, and of course, workflows, you know, we've we've heard a lot about those today. That uh, they have their own retry policies. So you may say, hey, you know, there's some kind of unhandled exception over here. You know, this is how I want to go about recovering this, separate from this or how I'm, you know, communicating with one resource or another. And, you know, mine's a small company, so I have a lot of say in the programming language that, you know, I use, again, focus on .NET, but that's not necessarily the case for other people. Um, you know, and, and frankly, increasingly, there are some capabilities and functionalities that are just, you know, they're, they're richer in some languages than others. You know, if in the, uh, the AI and ML world, you know, there's uh, a lot of libraries that really favor Python over C Sharp. And so, you know, I, I, I think back to at least uh, several years ago when uh, this was really tough to deal with. You know, you might maintain your Python app over here. You may have your .NET app over here. They deploy to their separate infrastructure, talk to each other through REST APIs. And, you know, there, there's just a lot of complexity there that, um, you know, platforms like Kubernetes have uh, really solved. Uh, and, and, you know, Dapper is really good at uh, enabling interoperability between these, you know, because each of these different SDKs are simply interfacing with the runtime, um, mostly via gRPC. Uh, the, you know, you, you have, um, you know, there, there's, a, there's a lot of work being done in the space, but you have the, the newer actor functionality with, uh, if you're using the JSON serialization that allows a, an actor to be, you know, written in one language and invoked and operated by an actor or service that's written in a different language. And that's you know, really useful. You know, again, it's, it's just a matter of knowing what's the, what's the identifier of what it is that you're talking to. And suddenly you just don't have to care as much about what language your any given program is interfacing with because you know, it, just, it just works. It's very helpful. And then it's, you know, security is always a, a big concern. You know, we, we spend a lot of time kind of focusing on the front door, how, how do things come into the application? But it's, it's also comforting to know that a, there's a lot of security in just how Dapper itself works. You know, the, uh, by, by default, the, uh, uh, you know, there, there's, a, there's a pluggable service discovery layer in Dapper itself, uh, uses MTLS by default. You can secure that with uh, X509 certificates if you need to. You can say, hey, you know, I, I want to ensure that requests that come into my platform, you know, that there is no way that someone can arbitrarily invoke my services. You know, uh, they must require some authentication token uh, be presented before Dapper will even respond. Uh, and vice versa, you can say, hey, you know, I want to make sure that the request I'm receiving from Dapper is valid, you know, and, you know, require a similar token from that side as well. And of course, you know, there's there's uh, building blocks for, you know, again, speaking to the abstractions earlier, that if I want to retrieve secrets from a secret provider, or I want to perform some kind of cryptographic operations, encryption, decryption, you know, that this is very easily done. Uh, you know, it's a matter of just send the, you know, send the, the day you want encrypted and, you know, the keys for doing it and get that response back. You know, it's, it's helpful. 
And then finally, you know, Dapper really prevents some vendor lock-in. You know, it, it runs wherever you want to. It runs on uh, local local machines, on Amazon, Azure, GCP. Uh, I've, I have applications running on Azure container apps and Kubernetes. Uh, I, I guess uh, recently wrote one that ran on uh, AWS's Fargate as well. And so, you know, you, you have many different components for each of these different building blocks that, you know, again, the, the, uh, uh, the, the capability of subbing those in as you need to is, you know, really helpful. You know, some of them are definitely more cost effective than others. Uh, some of them may have very necessary features that you just need, you know, um, and there's uh, the, the Dapper documentation has a chart kind of demonstrating what different capabilities are available with each of the state stores. But you may say, hey, you know, TTL is a, a thing that I need. I, I need to know that I'm not just accumulating data indefinitely in the store, you know, that it itself is being deleted, you know, after it's been sitting there for a month. And frankly, you may have some customers that have their own preferences about what it is that uh, you know, what it is that their platform is running on. They they only want to use Azure. Uh, they they don't want to use you know some other platform. And and while all the uh, all the abstractions there are really really helpful, it's, uh, I found it's also helpful to note that Tapper is opt in. So if you really really need some specialized capability that's not in a building block, uh, you know first. Check and see if there's a binding. You know, the, the binding will allow you to keep those resiliency policies and perhaps access that, you know, whatever that specialized feature is that you have. But if that's still insufficient, just don't use Dapper for that piece. Use the vendor's SDK. You know, sometimes it's a necessary fallback, but um, if you do that, um, I'd urge you to also file a, an issue in our GitHub so that we know that there's interest in that and you know, we can hopefully build towards that. So at this point, I think I'm going to go through uh, several, um, uh, take a look at uh, kind of the architectural layout of several key pieces inside applications that I've built. I find that the, you know, I've, I've, I've written several quick starts in the .NET SDK. Um, you know, I've, I've written lots of documentation for it. The, the quick starts, you know, they're simple. You know, they, they uh, are, are there to really kind of show you here's, here's the basics of what the functionality is and how to kind of get going with it. But I found, you know, in the real world, it's usually a little bit more complicated. So I guess what I wanted to kind of focus the rest of my uh, presentation on is really uh, go through seven kind of key functionalities that uh, I use in my applications so that you can kind of see you know, how, how you can kind of tie a lot of these uh, disparate dapper building blocks uh, into one another. So I think uh, it makes sense to start with user registration. Uh, I guess I want to, you know, call this out. Uh, bear with me. I want to put all the patterns so they fit on a single slide, uh, but I also want the text to be readable. So uh, these aren't necessarily as linear as I'd like. Um, so I guess I will uh, use my little laser pointer as I need to. Um, but anyway, so here we go. So there, there are a great many scenarios. I mean, we've we've seen a lot about workflows today, and you're going to see some more. Uh, and so this is what uh, you know. I my applications usually use with regards to user provisioning. So it starts. You know, there's almost always some kind of a, a endpoint that triggers these things. Uh, there, uh, it's going to receive the request for you know creating the new user. Uh, and I usually have a number of checks here. So is there already a user that matches this email address? Yeah, if so, notate the attempt to duplicate it and fail out. Uh, is there a user registration in progress? Uh, you know, if, if so, you know, again, we, we don't want to necessarily double that up. And so, you know, fail out at that point. Uh, is this user potentially the first one on a tenant? You know, if, if so, there's going to be additional work that needs to be queued up uh, after this process has ended. Uh, if it passes these checks, uh, you know, we'll persist the registration data. And yeah, that, of course, will tell us that the uh, registration is in progress. We're going to save that. And, um, you know, I, I want to make sure that these are real accounts. So I'm going to validate the email address. This, this is an excellent opportunity for uh, actors. So uh, I, I'll, I'll send this um, 
send the information about this registration into this actor, spin up an immediate, a one day and a three day reminder. And at each of those invocations, this will send an email using the SendGrid binding uh, to the customer. Uh, each of these using some kind of a template to just say, here's, um, you know, uh, we saw that you tried to register an account. Uh, please click on this link to verify it. That link contains the ID of this workflow. Uh, along with some additional key information. So I can essentially validate that, you know, it, it, that kind of serves two things. You know, when they click on the link, hopefully they do, uh, when they click on it, that tells me how I can spin, you know, identify this workflow and spin it back up, but also gives me some information so I can look up this particular, you know, registration data itself. And so if, if they click on that, you know, Great. You know, we we we're waiting for the user. We can we continue. If the you know if they don't click on it again, the the actor is uh, uh, the these reminders are persisted, and so after a day, after three days, it's going to try again. It's if if that utterly fails, uh, you know, they they never uh, follow up with me again. Yeah, you know, that's fine. Uh, it'll essentially I guess take a an undocumented path here and end without completing. Uh, if it, if they do click on this link, uh, it's going to assign any kind of roles that they need. Again, if, if this required provisioning a new tenant, then, um, you know, we're, we're probably going to kick off a separate workflow for that. Um, and then, uh, you know, send a welcome email again, use the single binding, tie that to another template, fill in the details, you know, put their name in there, email address it's going to link to how it is that they sign in and then end. And then there's often a, a bunch of other services that are interested in knowing that a user has been registered. Again, if uh, you know, if if the if it requires spinning up another tenant, you know, maybe I put this in a queue so that some other service can kind of pick that up and provision it. And you know, we'll we'll look at that uh, in a future block as well. So you know, invoice generation, we you know, common common problem. Uh, you know, I, I want to generate the invoice to send to a customer in advance uh, and just kind of say, hey, you know, this this is something that's going to happen on the same calendar every month. You know, it's, it's not necessarily the first of the month. You know, if someone signed up for an account on the 16th, then, you know, every month on the 16th, I need to uh, generate another invoice for them. Um, that, of course, makes billing fun because, you know, it may be 30 days, 31 days, but, you know, there you go. <clears throat> um but each, typically each billing account is going to be assigned one of these actors. Uh, and that's going to run at a fairly semi-random time of day, so I can get a better distribution of when exactly the actor is invoked. You know, again, uh, startup, I'm, I'm interested in lessening, lowering my costs on wherever this is running. So if I can avoid having all of the actors spin up at exactly the same time, <clears throat> that's less load in my system. I don't have to pay for as expensive an underlying infrastructure. But when that reminder is triggered, uh, the client's going to need information about the customer in order to populate at the top. You know, invoice it has their name, it has their address, phone number information. And it's going to pull that out of state. Uh, it's then going to read the file itself. Uh, usually, this is a Word file that is distributed along with the service itself. Uh, I like to use the mail merge functionality in Word to tag different elements. And I use a, a third party library. Uh, through an um, uh, API, uh, a company called SyncFusion, to swap out the components of that Word file, generate a PDF, and save that PDF via the, uh, the Azure Blob Storage binding into Blob Storage. It's, it's, you know, blobs themselves are pretty heavy to just pass around. Uh, it's a lot lighter weight uh, in, just, uh, in terms of messaging and uh, throughput to send information about where the file is saved instead of you know, try to pass that entire file itself around. Uh, and uh, then that's going to essentially send, uh, you know, use the single binding, send that to the customer and just say, hey, you know, here's your invoice. Here's, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll say, you know, I'll, I'll save the reference to it, have a link to it. Uh, I'll often uh, attach it as well. But either way, yes, it's an invoice sent off to the customer, and you know, without having to do anything, you know, the the actor is just going to, uh, you know, start this off again on the next calendar month. Uh, this is actually something that uh, can utilize uh, some uh, a feature that was just released in the last version of Dapper, 
uh, we have a new schedule API. And so where this one is a little bit elaborate, so reminders are set on a, using a time span. And so you have to say, you know, it, the, the next invocation should run uh, 30 days from now or 31 days from now. And, you know, that, that it's, it's not a uh, very cumbersome problem, but it's definitely something that you have to kind of keep in mind is, you know, if you want this to run at a, you know, in some point in this hour block on, you know, this, this, you know, this particular calendar day, you know, you're going to have to calculate that out. So each of these reminders is the appropriate length uh, of time. Uh, the new scheduling API simplifies that a lot, you know, because you can now use a cron expression and just say, I want this to be something that runs uh, on the 16th of every month or the, the 12th of every month. And then, you know, easy enough to say, you know, what, what hour and minute I want this thing to run at. And so, um, anyway, that's, uh, that's, that's kind of that. It's very straightforward. Um, uh, the scheduling API will be available in the .NET SDK uh, as of the 1.15 release. So very excited about that. You've got uh, payment processing. So, say uh, they receive the invoice. They say, "Hey, great, let's uh, let's run with it and um, and, and pay this thing." Uh, again, the request is going to come into our payment service. Uh, usually, I you know this would be one of those you know when there's a new customer, you know, spin up a new tenant. Uh, it's going to call the service, and you know now it's going to use this new schedule API. Uh, and uh, schedule um, schedule an operation with the card validation service every month. So on the first of every month, um, it's, uh, this this kind of falls into uh, how can I prevent a charge against the card uh, that may itself be invalid. You know, I, I can't necessarily know the card's going to be invalid until I try to execute a, a charge, uh, but I can definitely check the date on it. So if if the card has expired. That's a great sign that's not going to work. Uh, and so, by using the the schedule API, I can look at that card and say, "Hey, you know, this month, next month, maybe the next one, your card is about to expire. Send an email off to the customer, let them know about it, uh, so that hopefully, you know, the, uh, the payment processing can kind of go through, and you know, we can, um, you know, uh, ensure a timely timely charge. So that that's, that's going to run in the background." Uh, otherwise, when a request comes in to actually execute the payment, this is again going to start another workflow. Uh, you know, work workflows are again great for anything that is multiple steps that have some dependency on one to uh, one to the next. Uh, uh, this just happens to be one that's uh, best as a chained operation. So here we're going to find the customer, you know, pull that out of storage, uh, and uh, we're going to um, you know validate the card. Uh, it's it's, it's going to kind of pretty much do the same thing as this one does, but again, it's one of those. I'd much rather you know before I try and charge the card, verify that it's something that's going to work. You know, they may have been, you know, routinely ignoring these emails that were sent uh, to them about, hey, your card's about to expire. You know, it happens. <laughs> so, uh, you know, validate it. If it's still an invalid date, you know, we'll pause the workflow here. You know, we'll say, hey, we'll come back later. We'll uh, wait for them to. You know, uh, they've, they've seen this email, wait for them to respond. Uh, again, the, the link that kind of shares the, you know, we need this information, it's going to have a, it's, it's going to be persistent storage alongside other information so that we can easily resume this workflow later. Um, and I guess we'll kind of get to that in a second. We'll attempt to charge the card. You know, if, if the card works, uh, we'll look at the uh, receipt generation. You know, we'll send that to a receipt generation. Say, hey, we've got information. We need another file generated. And again, we'll look at that in a second. If it does fail, again, it's going to be a very similar pipeline. Just say, hey, you know, send them an email. Say, hey, we tried to charge your card. Uh, we're not sure what went wrong. Maybe the payment processor has more information for us. Uh, you know, wait for it uh, and see what happens. Uh, but payment dubbing is a feature that a lot of payment processors include. So that's the idea that if you charge the card, it didn't work. You want to try it again. Maybe you want to wait for them to do something, you know, fix the card, change the card to something else, whatever. Uh, and so this schedules a reminder on another actor. And so it just says, hey, you know, 
Uh, here's here's how much time we have. Maybe send them an email at, at regular intervals, and you know maybe increasingly say, hey, you know, this is the the third reminder we've sent you this month. Your payment is now late. Uh, you know, whatever. It's, it's, it's a, a number of different templates you can send through SendGrid. Uh, but uh, and and at the end of the day, you know, maybe it says, hey, it's an invalid card. We've sent five of these payments. Send another signal to another service and simply terminate this. This is. Uh, you know, the the charges or the, uh, the 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 tenant is in default on payments, stop operations, and there you go. But again, it's another workflow. So, <clears throat> how do, might you handle uh, more of a, an elaborate file generation? You know, in, in this case, you know, we're looking at uh, you know receipts. So, as in all of these patterns, uh, there's an entry service that's going to kick off this operation. Is going to need information from the previous operation. I, I for for ease of maintaining these workflows, uh, I will typically have a different variation of this uh, service for each document I'm generating. So there's one that does receipts. There's one that may do, you know, again invoices. The one for any of these different documents because they're going to be slightly different in what exactly are the activities that you do. And so from a uh, I guess a question was raised earlier about workflow versioning. That's very difficult. <laughs> so it's it's not a straightforward process. And so in the interest of minimizing changes to these workflows, uh, I favor having a lot of very similar workflows and very similar activities instead of one super generic workflow that I can repurpose with any number of things. Because every time I change that, I'm gonna have to deal with well, what changed? I changed the model. I changed, uh, you know, the, the the flow of it. And remember, these these need to be deterministic workflows. And so that that can be, become very difficult when you start swapping things out. So discrete workflows are key. Um, the uh, you know here we're going to get the details of this. Get that from the the storage, uh, uh, the the state store. Uh, we're going to generate the document in PDF. Again, kind of talked about what, how we do that on the other slide. Persist that to the CDN. Uh, this is one of those, there isn't a binding for it. Uh, I typically use a Bunny CDN for this. Um, so I've got my own SDK for that. Again, that's 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 fine. You know, Dapper is opt-in. If you if it doesn't have what you need, you know, use, use the third-party SDK as you need to. And then we're going to persist this to state. Again, it's, it's a lot uh, cheaper and more lighter weight to pass messages, like here's their URL to the object, uh, instead of necessarily passing the entire object around. And then again, we're going to email the customer. We're going to persist when it is that we sent this file. Now, this is very specific to receipts. You know, we just want to make sure that, you know, the receipt was sent and that, uh, uh, you know, See what happens, uh, but this is also there's also a service that's waiting to listen back from SendGrid in this case uh, to hear about the email lifecycle, and so this is essentially going to say, you know, do we re receive a bounce notification if if the email is you know if it's bounced? Okay, great, that's a whole other you know question. You know, we we need to go reach out to the user. Something's wrong with your email address. If the email uh, was marked as red, great, we're going to persist that timestamp. Uh, you know that may be useful in a future support request. Um, you know it, whatever that that lifecycle endpoint is going to be, we're going to save that, listen for them, and then at some point there's going to be a timeout. And again, that's also kind of key to this versioning. Uh, the, the versioning strategy is have a timeout as to what's the maximum amount of time that this workflow can run. Uh, you can have very very long running workflows if you really want. Uh, be careful versioning those. <laughs> uh, you're you're going to have to have some kind of a way of you know branching. If I've got model version one, model version two, model version three, uh, you're going to have to have uh, some way of understanding how to deal with each of those in a you know readily used way. I find it's a lot easier to say if you have a bunch of kind of shorter running workflows, uh, then if there is a known time at which they will end. That's the end of which you have to maintain that version of that workflow, those activities, that model. So it, may, it kind of makes ongoing maintenance a little bit easier. Um, I have a lot of report visualizations. 
I guess I, I, it looks like I'm starting to run a little bit low on time, so we'll, we'll kind of speed this up a little bit. Uh, I have a lot of uh, dashboard reports. Uh, each of the elements in a dashboard, you know, you may have line charts, you may have um, uh, you know, bar charts, whatever it is, are all pulling their data from somewhere. They may all have separate uh, uh, intervals at which the data itself has to be refreshed. This is a great use of Dapper Actor. Yeah. You know, they, they can uh, persist and recall data uh, outside of the actor to a more permanent storage block. But again, they're, they're excellent for performing interval-based operations. So here I may have these different report elements themselves registered with whatever, you know, template actor stores their information. You know, what, what style, you know, what, um, uh, what, what's the style of whatever this element represents, you know, line chart or whatever. Uh, and you know they're going to you know each be configured with the data source of you know what do they get their information from you know uh, you know maybe I need a connection string pulled from the the secret store from a, a key vault maybe I need a um, uh, you know uh, uh, maybe I need you know the, the query that's being used uh, from you know Cosmos DB or SQL storage or you know, a SQL server or what have you. Um, and you know that this this information is going to include that metadata about how I am pulling this data, how I'm projecting it, shaping the results, uh, and so I can push it into a cache. And you know, at the end of the day, you could have a, a kind of a naive implementation of a report that says someone views the report, it goes and executes this query at the back end, shows it to the user. That's going to be great right up until you need to show that to a hundred different people at a time. And now you're you know kicking off that same operation for all hundred people, and you know putting a lot of load on your your backing system. This this approach uh, kind of simplifies that because it says that the, the you know I, I rarely have a need for real time reports myself. If you need real time reports, this isn't going to be your thing. You know, go go and do those uh, those real time queries. But you know this approach says that. Each of the individual pieces of the reports can all themselves, you know, run independent of each other, access the information they need, put it somewhere so that all these front end visualizations can pull from that cache, read that. You know, those those of course are, um, you know, caches tend to be much more higher performance uh, for you know returning you know known sets of data. Uh, and you know, it, it also supports, you know, they typically support TTL. So you know if, if the uh, uh, if the report is paused or deleted, you don't necessarily need another system in here to go back to storage and say, hey, you know this this uh, report is now obsolete. You know, delete this information. You know, we're not showing that report anymore. It'll clear it itself. You know, that's very useful. Um, we've got uh, a data aggregator. So I have a a, a bunch of need for. Um, you know, an, an ongoing need to be able to receive data uh, at some endpoint. You know, here's a little example of just a, some some basic JSON that may look like. And I, I guess we saw a presentation that uh, touched on this uh, earlier as well. Um, but the uh, data comes in, goes to a topic broker, and topics uh, as opposed to queues, of course, mean that the message itself is going to be relayed to each of the groups of services subscribing. So I've tried to kind of detail each of these groups in their little boxes. Uh, these, um, uh, you know, the it, it, the message comes in, routes each of these services, they handle them as they need to, uh, you know, send their outbound information out to a queue where it can be persisted uh, back into storage, and um, and you know, there you go, kind of straightforward. So you know, all the all the different ways in which you may need to aggregate something. You know, again, you can just have another set of services uh, simply subscribe to that endpoint, process as you need to, uh, you know, and and save. And so that that can uh, you know, again. Kind of the, the theme here is that Dapper is really good at uh, stepping in, solving a lot of these uh, individual problems that you may have, and um, uh, yeah, it's it's very flexible, and you can build very elaborate, uh, complex things with that. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, if you have any questions, you know now, happy to answer them. If you have them down the road, you know, please reach out on the Dapper Discord, and I'd be more than happy to speak with you.